This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Do you want a new podcast to look forward to each week? One that's got it all, entertainment, information, and stuffed with actionable content? Yeah, you do. Because who wouldn't want to listen in as Jordan dives into the minds of fascinating people from athletes, authors, and scientists to mobsters and spies? Each week, Jordan uses his interviewing talents to bring you never-before-heard stories and insights to make life more understandable. He has one of the most highly rated self-development shows out there. Listen in, learn, and look forward to each new episode, like I do. And I would like to recommend a few episodes myself. The first one is episode 650, Brian Kloss, The Corruptible Influence of Power. And the other one is episode 585 with Timothy Snyder, 20th Century Lessons on Tyranny. Check them both out. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II, Episode 47, Those Behind the Heroes. The people that made up the support teams behind the RAF fighter pilots allowed those few to maintain their needed operational status to combat the Luftwaffe. By the time of the Battle of Britain, it's estimated that each RAF pilot was supported by at least 100 people, even more if one looked further behind the exciting planes and young faces. But in mid-1940, the majority of the populace was not in an active role in the war, not yet. Those working for the war effort were doing all they could, and they needed to be. The army was practically defenseless, the navy desperately preparing for an invasion, and the RAF was as edgy and uncertain as everyone else mentioned so far. Compared to their enemy, the British could have used more planes and pilots, but, as it was, fighter command had been preparing for this war for years. And the British people had belief in themselves, if little hope. Surely Hitler would come, like he had to so many countries before. In many ways, the pages of the Battle of Britain were already written, at least in its broad strokes, by fortune's hand. Many critical issues had been worked on and over since the mid-1930s by fighter command, but also by civilian organizations. For example, the Type 300, designed by R.J. Mitchell, which would later be named the Spitfire, was a private venture. The Hurricane as well. Both companies kept the Air Ministry informed of their development, but they saw the writing on the wall in Europe and wanted Britain to have the appropriate defense. In short, the government was kept out and found itself writing its officially desired specifications along the already produced fighter planes. Had the two developers built a plane along the Air Ministry specs as they were, the resulting products would not have come even close to offering effective combat to the Luftwaffe. In another example of the military being outpaced by private ventures, in March of 1936, the Hawker Sidley Group decided, without a contract from the government, to draw plans for a factory that could produce 1,000 planes. This decision risked the loss of the company, but resulted in fighter command having at least 400 more hurricanes by August of 1940. It was truly a time of country before company. This same kind of private venture was undertaken for the Merlin engine that would power both RAF fighters. In the early 1930s, Sir Henry Royce noted the current Gossox engines, but noticed their glaring limited abilities. Right before he died on April 22, 1933, He authorized PV, or Private Venture 12, a newer, bigger, 12-cylinder engine, and its first one ran on October 15th of that year. Impressed, the government offered to finance further development. The PV-12 became the Merlin. Another gamble, another success, and Dowding's air defense was strengthened for it. One aspect of the battle that is often overlooked 
is the RAF fighter's use of 100 octane fuel. The result of using a fuel with this rating was an increase in power that helped the Spitfire meet the ME-109 on a more or less equal footing. And although Dr. S. F. Birch pioneered the alkylation process, it was the U.S. Army Air Corps that was able to complete the process on a large enough scale necessary for war. The U.S., in the spirit of an alliance, offered it to Britain. But even then, it would not have been used if not for Air Commodore Rod Banks, who urged that Merlin engines be modified for use of this purified fuel in 1937. He wrote that, quote, even if the supply of such fuel were limited, because the use of high-duty equipment might prove decisive in the air in the early stages of the war, unquote. A profit, indeed. So the Merlin engine was now made to run on this superior fuel, but it still came from abroad. More work was done, and soon a fuel called BAM-100, British Air Ministry 100, was developed. The first cargo was sent from Aruba in June 1939. It was stockpiled for the next year and dyed green to stand out. Somehow, it was successfully kept from the attention of the German spies. With the outbreak of the war in the West in May 1940, it was used for the first time. Simply, it boosted the performance of the Merlins appreciatively. The engine's horsepower went from 1,030 to 1,310. This increase brought the Hurricane up to the performance level of the ME-109 and the Spitfire just beyond it. The idea of allowing or hoping a green pilot would live long enough to get sufficient experience did not exist in the battle over the channel. So it was decided right before the war to install a camera gun during practice flights. The ability to point out mistakes and missed opportunities improved significantly overnight. But besides this, the 16mm products of Williamson Manufacturing Company of London helped Fighter Command keep an accurate record of victories and hits in the battle. Pilots are pilots, after all. In some ways... Beyond all these subjects mentioned, radio proved to be the invaluable asset to RAF pilots. Because the Luftwaffe could attack Great Britain anywhere from Norway to France, the radio allowed ground crews to direct patrols to any threatened area. It would have been unimaginable to patrol every possible point of attack constantly, even if the RAF had triple its numbers in planes and pilots. So, incredible amounts of fuel and pilot hours were conserved because of this. And once enemy fighters were inside and behind the RDF station's detection, their locations could still be tracked by the Observer Corps. These dedicated volunteers kept fighter commands via phone lines apprised of enemy locations and their vectors. Then fighter command could relay the up-to-date information to the pilots, that is, as long as they could understand what was being said over the TR-9D high-frequency sets. The ability to communicate during an actual battle was the radio's next biggest contribution, as pilots could warn each other of pursuit and devise tactics to deal with a situation during a dogfight. Because, even though the antenna was screened from the engine's ignition system, interference could still be relied on to interrupt at least half of the incoming and outgoing messages. But again, a non-governmental sponsored answer was on the way. A Hawker Hurricane was fitted with a civilian test trial of the first very high frequency, or VHF radio, TR-1133, in 1939. The improvement was immediate, clarity was the result, and the simple whip antenna offered very little drag. Still, change even impressive ones like this take time, and the first installed VHF radio was not in a Spitfire until August 20th, 1940, just two weeks after Adler Talk started. And it would not be until 1942 that all the old HF radios were removed. Beyond these improvements, two additions were made to radios to help focus the RAF's limited resources. The first was IFF, or identification, friend, or foe. This semi-automatic system, where an RAF radio 
especially one in a fighter, would review all nearby radios, and hence, all nearby aircraft. Friendly aircraft would immediately and automatically respond with a short coded signal, and any radio that did not respond would indicate a not friendly aircraft, or hostile. So the pilot could look at a screen and see who and how many planes were nearby, and who was friendly, and who was a threat. The second edition was a radio DF, or direction finding. This device was not new, but its application was. Each sector commander on the ground had several specially built DF stations that regularly received signals from a few fighters in each squadron. So the sector leaders knew the bearing or direction the planes were going in, not just their present location. Just like when Sherlock Holmes was figuring out a mystery, what was needed was data. And this added to the ground leader's information about what his flyers were up to. To be sure, the government under Churchill was dedicated to the cause, and due to the Prime Minister, the Ministry of Aircraft Production, or MAP, was set up on May 14, 1940, and headed by the dynamic Lord Beaverbrook. He personally handled the expansion of the Civilian Repair Organization, or CRO, which would be spread out even more widely than the aircraft factories. This way, no amount of destruction would bring their work to a stop. It was Lord Beaverbrook's non-stop work method that allowed MAP to bring every aspect of production of parts, but also the repairing of damaged planes under tight, efficient control. Thus organized, airframes, engines, and accessories were made and repaired quickly. One record shows that a particular hurricane was shot down three times and repaired each time. A specific Spitfire had received five different propellers during the war. But since the production and repair factories were scattered out for protection, their products would all eventually need to be moved to the front, in this case, along the coasts. So the Air Transport Auxiliary, or ATA, was formed on September 1, 1939, by Sir Gerard Erlanger. The organization used amateur and semi-professional pilots of both sexes, mostly aged 30 to 50, to pilot their planes. The times, being what they were, most authorities and the establishment, in general, were shocked by the idea of female flyers. But, after all, there was a war on, and one would think that the more people pulling on the collective rope, the better. However, humans are flawed creatures, and those in certain authoritarian positions purposefully put these newly elected couriers into outdated Harvards and Blenheims. Their goal was to show the system as unworkable, and then have it scrapped. But these pilots, regardless of age or sex, were only too happy or proud to do their part, and most completed the training and selection process. In fact, there would be an all-female ferry pool opened at Hatfield on January 1, 1940. At its height, the ATA would number 650 pilots, all civilian, and they would wear their distinctive dark blue uniform with pride. They made over 300,000 deliveries in all kinds of weather without armament or radio. And by the time of the Battle of Britain, it was a well-organized machine, just like the RDF stations and the response system built around them. In fact, when we're further down the road in this podcast, I'll be sharing the story of Nancy Miller Livingston Stratford, an American who flew for the British Air Transport Auxiliary from 1942 to 45. And thanks to my wife for finding an autographed copy of her memoir. And of course, there was Ultra, which was the code name for the deciphered messages from the German Enigma machines. In essence, the German military used Enigma machines to code their radio messages to each other, not knowing the Poles and French had had success in breaking their codes before the invasion of Poland. This knowledge, along with an actual Enigma machine, would be passed on to the British. Working endlessly at Bletchley Park, which I hope to see many of you there this fall, crypto analysts would improve upon what was given to them and be able to read Hitler's, his generals, and for our current story, Goering's messages that were, in effect, the policy of how he would fight the battle over the channel. The story of Ultra is amazing in itself and will receive our full attention soon, but for now, 
Downing was very glad to have access to this information. All is fair in love and war, after all. Another important part of the overall defense of Britain were the ground-based systems of anti-aircraft guns and balloon barrage. But at the time, the AA guns were still under the control of the army. The RAF regiment had yet to be formed. And even though the army's 3.7-inch and 4.5-inch guns could reach the Luftwaffe's operational ceiling, in the end, the ammunition used per kill was an unmitigated waste. For example, on the night of October 15th, 16th, 235 German bombers raided London. A total of 8,326 shells were used to ring up a score of two kills with a further two enemy planes damaged. No, not effective or efficient. But their main reason for being wasn't effectiveness. The main reason for the AA guns was morale. To have the big guns firing away up at the skies made an impressive sight and sound. And that flash and noise gave many on the ground hope. It also, equally important, demonstrated the attitude that Britain was fighting back. Whatever the cost of those guns and shells, they more than paid for themselves. The anti-aircraft's guns partners were the searchlights. Their job was to find and illuminate the enemy bombers overhead. But this was rarely achieved, and even when accomplished, the gun batteries could do little. In truth, the searchlight's greatest achievement was in blinding the German pilots. Still, this in itself helped tremendously. The Germans were engaged in general terror bombing and destruction. They weren't going to be hitting anything specific on purpose, any more than the British bombers. The searchlight's task remained difficult until they were later equipped with target tracking radar. But even then, that did not help the AA guns shoot the bombers out of the sky. A major reason for the weakness of the AA guns was that there were never many built. Out of desperation, the British adopted and acquired some Swedish 40mm Beaufort's in 1938. Without them, this weak link in the chain of defense would have been even more ridiculous. But even these were in pitifully small numbers. The British simply had no equivalent to the German light flat guns that traveled with their armies. Their 37mm and their quad 20mm guns were produced and used by the thousands. Like the ineffectual AA guns, the balloon barrage was more a block to the German pilots psychologically, not literally. They were hardly ever raised over 5,000 feet, but certainly would have caused significant damage if a German pilot tried to release his payload below that altitude. But truth be told, more Allied aircraft were damaged in the coming years than any Luftwaffe. And again, like the RDF stations and the response system, working out who would be where in regards to AA guns, balloons, airfields, supplemental airfields, all was worked out more or less before the war. This planning paid huge dividends as airfields were put on sites picked out so that tarmac or any other kind of paving was not needed. Also, the airfields were large enough so that planes could be scattered out and, consequently, relatively few were damaged due to enemy bombing. But what damage was done to the takeoff and landing strips was quickly repaired as it only involved moving dirt. And, fortune being on their side, the British workers were needed during the summer of 1940, when they would not be too adversely affected by the weather. Also, they were able to sleep under canvases close to their responsibilities. Of course, the Germans enjoyed the same conditions and the same naturally smooth, grassy runways. The British had begun to pave runways at the beginning of the war, but realized the advantage of flat ground and slowed down this process until the Americans came in 1942. The other major reason for this was the non-existent modern earth-moving equipment. The first bulldozers arrived along with the U.S. forces. Hey everyone, Ray here. Let me tell you something you already know. All those free trial subscriptions you see all over the place that look so tempting, well, they renew without your consent. Why? 
because they can, and because businesses are counting on you to forget about that one time you clicked yes on something, and they will just keep pocketing your money. But here's the part you may not know. There's help for that, and its name is Truebill. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions you don't need, want, or simply forgot about. Because companies make subscriptions hard to cancel, Truebill combats that by making their process incredibly simple. Just link your accounts and Truebill will cancel your unwanted subscriptions in one tap. And on average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Don't let the corporations continue to nickel and dime you to death. And with Truebill, your Truebill concierge is there when you need them to cancel an unwanted subscription, so you don't have to. And Truebill has made my life so much easier, finding subscriptions that I totally forgot about, which left me saying, I love Truebill. So join me and two other million users who have saved over $100 million. Or like Matthew B., who says, In a matter of seconds, I saved $666 for the year on my Direct TV bill, saved $120 for the year on my Sirius XM bill, saved $840 a year on car insurance. So please support the show and do something smart for yourself. Don't fall for subscription scams. Start canceling today at Truebill.com slash World War II. Go right now. Truebill.com slash World War II. It could save you thousands a year. Truebill.com slash World War II. As for the civilians, private homes damaged during the battle did not constitute a major drain on resources because major repairs were held until near the end of the battle. To be sure, homes were made livable, but not thoroughly fixed up until it was reasonable to assume no new damage would be inflicted. Because of this decision, manpower and equipment could focus on repairing the vital links of the air shield, RDF stations, hangars, and telephone lines, which connected all the various parts of the defense system. Before the battle, dealing with injuries to its crew, the RAF used its own limited facilities, the RAF Hospital at Halton which was under the control of the Air Vice Marshal. This was true since its inception in 1919, but in 1928, it was enlarged and improved as it became a part of the Princess Mary's RAF Nursing Services, or PMRAFNS. But even this improvement was not enough as casualties increased. Its capacity and capabilities were stretched to the limit as the RAF gave battle over the channel. There was also the challenge of dealing with the numerous burn victims. Soon, a special burns unit was opened at Halton, and because of the sheer numbers involved, it increased in size and skill. The special unit's ability soon rivaled those of a civilian unit in East Grinstead under Sir Archibald McIndoe, whose efforts will later be covered in great detail. His guinea pig club was made up of burned pilots undergoing surgery of an experimental nature that focused on reconstructive work using new equipment designed specifically to treat their injuries. By the end of the war, some 649 men would be called My Children by McIndoe, and in return, they would call him The Boss. Two more hospitals would later be opened. One was another PMRAFNS hospital near RAF Roten in Swindon, the other was an RAF hospital called the Institute of Aviation Medicine at Farnborough. This institution focused primarily on psychological research rather than treatment. And then there were those on the ground that dealt with the bombs, whether they exploded or not, that fell on the civilians. After the bombs fell, the firemen and the heavy rescue squads were the first to rush into burning and collapsed buildings or to deal with an unexploded bomb. Was it a delayed action bomb, or did it simply fail to go off on impact? Their job was to find out, to save lives and minimize the damage. As you can imagine, many died doing their duty. And finally, for the British, there was the newly formed local defense volunteers. However, their name would soon be changed by Churchill to the Home Guard. 
Of their many duties, they would be informed by the Observer Corps of planes going down, friend or foe, and were expected to succor any British pilots or apprehend and detain any German ones. But, with the fear that most felt that summer, the Home Guard got a reputation, rightly deserved, of shooting at pilots floating down on their parachutes, and other equally rough treatment. Fortunately, these men were mostly bad shots, or nervous, so their countrymen survived to fight another day, and the German pilots survived to be questioned by authorities. As the pilots hit the ground, the Army or Home Guard was still likely to physically attack them with whatever weapons they had at their disposal. But normally, a good, long, loud tirade of swear words would convince the attackers that indeed, the man underfoot was not the Bosch. This, of course, is not to make light of the invaluable, but less trained Home Guard. The regular army was fewer in numbers at the time, and was not seriously armed, for the most part. So the Home Guard was included and incorporated into the plans of defense by General Ironside, the Commander-in-Chief Home Forces, in late June. The defensive plan, fortunately, never had to be used and was altered very little over time, and it went like this. There would be an initial line of defense arrayed along the probable invasion beaches on the coast. These men understood that their job was to engage the enemy there and not retreat. It wasn't that they would be sacrificed. Their job was to hold the enemy so that mobile reserves could swing in or around at some vulnerable point and counterattack before the invaders could push inland. The second line of defense constituted a line of anti-tank obstacles manned by the Home Guard. The coastlines to the south and east, as well as London and the industrial centers, were protected from armored vehicles in this way. German panzers racing over the British countryside was Churchill's greatest fear. Lastly, behind the Home Guard line was the main reserves for any major counteroffensive that would take place. In their endeavor to protect British soil, Concrete pillboxes, piles of sandbags, and anti-tank ditches were constructed on front lawns, gardens, main roads, intersections, and golf courses. Thousands of obstacles were placed to disrupt the landing of airborne troops that had wrought so much havoc on the continent. All radar stations, fuel depots, and airfields, and there were 375 in all, were guarded from sabotage and direct attack. And finally, Detailed plans were made to destroy roads, bridges, and anything else that may be of use to the enemy, if it looked as though the asset was about to fall into enemy hands. But there was no general plan to destroy everything if the Germans made a landing. As Churchill later wrote, there was no question of a scorched earth policy. England was to be defended by its people, not destroyed. The German support teams, meanwhile, had been and would be equally busy and, by mid-July, the Luftwaffe had 50 air bases and another 50 satellite airfields in occupied territory. By the time of Adlertag, those bases made, if one connected their locations on a map, a line from Norway to France, and were stocked and fully operational. As for the German workers back home, they have been able to produce 495 aircraft each month for the first four months of the war. With the new year of 1940, the workers kept their 40-hour work week, but were able to increase production to 990 aircraft a month. By September of 1940, they reached their peak of 1,205 aircraft each month, while still working 40 hours a week. This is what they produced versus what was requested. The people enjoyed their government successes, but they still had a fear of war and that fear drove them to most always build more than was asked for. In fact, orders were lessened after the fall of France, but the people still worked hard in their factories. The requested number of aircraft would not officially increase until the war in the East was launched. And while the British were able to knock out 1,653 German planes from the sky during the Battle of Britain and beyond, those losses, despite all their hard work, were hard to replace when one looks at the plane and the experienced pilot in it. The Luftwaffe pilots were only the elite of the air personnel in Germany. The other parts of the Luftwaffe were the AA personnel and the Luftdienst. The latter were the equivalent 
to the British ATA, or Air Transport Auxiliary. Like their British counterparts, they ferried supplies, pilots, planes, towed targets for practice, and assisted in rescues and casualty evacuations. Soon their ranks would be filled with wounded Luftwaffe pilots. And finally, the intelligence gathering of Nazi Germany and the Luftwaffe was the mirror opposite of the RAF. The Germans were attacking, and the fighting occurred over the Channel and Britain. Not too much intelligence was needed, except how many British planes were shot down and how many British ships were sunk. Luftwaffe policy and the overall strategy had a simple chain of command. Goering was in charge, issued his orders, and expected them to be carried out. An excerpt from The Battle of Britain by Richard Townsend Bickers The slender resources of the Anti-Aircraft Command were strained to provide guns for the defense of the most important fighter and bomber aerodromes. High altitude and both war guns were provided up to the limit considered practicable, and the effort was reinforced by the use of Royal Air Force detachments with Lewis guns and some hundreds of 20 millimeter cannon, which were not immediately required for use in aircraft. A small type of rocket was also installed at many airdromes. These were arranged in lines along the perimeter and could be fired up to a height of something under 1,000 feet in the face of low-flying attack. They carried a small bomb on the end of a wire. Some limited success was claimed during a low-flying attack on Kenley, and they probably had some moral effect when their existence became known to the enemy. They were, of course, capable of physical effect only against very low horizontal attacks. Air Chief Marshal Lord Dowling. And now, the Battle of Britain. Monday, July 29th, had fair weather over most of Britain, and the Luftwaffe tried to catch Fighter Command napping with an early morning raid over Dover Harbor. A little after 7 a.m., a single raider flew over the harbor at 24,000 feet. It was assumed to be a reconnaissance flight only because at 7.18, four groups of German aircraft of at least 80 in strength, assembled over the Calais, Boulogne, and St. Omer area, and by 7.34 a.m. were making their way to Dover. On the flight over, the raiders organized themselves into two groups. Each group had about 20 Stuka 87 bombers with an equal number of fighters, either ME-109s or 110s. With their radar, Fighter Command saw the planes as soon as they achieved some height and were ready. Four squadrons were launched, 41 and 64, made up of Spitfires, and 43 and 56, composed of Hurricanes. The first raiding group was handled effectively enough, but the situation was still chaotic, and perhaps that was the intent. The second group of German bombers and fighters had a slightly easier time of it on their initial run and were able to cause damage to the shipping at Dover. One merchant vessel, already in for repairs, was hit and sunk. A nearby yacht was hit and disappeared under the waves as well. A third naval vessel was hit and damaged, but somehow stayed afloat. As for the harbor itself, an oil pipeline was ruptured, and a few buildings suffered from splinter damage. But this was all the damage the Luftwaffe would do this day, in Dover. In the ensuing dogfight, confusion reigned, especially when it came to confirming victories on either side but at least six German aircraft were shot down, as well as three for the RAF. Two Spitfires and one Hurricane. Further significant damage was done to each side, of course, but confirmation of additional kills was difficult, to say the least. There would be other raids this day to the south and far north, but there were few additional engagements due to the raiders turning back or the attack was repulsed before targets below could be attacked. This included an attack near Harridge that was broken up and driven off. Around 5 p.m. that afternoon, the destroyer HMS Delight left Portland to patrol the west coast. Because it was not escorting a convoy, it was deemed safe enough to travel the channel. But it wasn't called Hell's Corner for nothing. About an hour and a half later, Bombers from Cherbourg took off and attacked the ship. 
One bomb penetrated the foredeck, which led to further explosions below. Eighteen crew members were killed, with another fifty-nine wounded. The Delight managed to turn around and was able to make its way back to Portland, under its own steam. Total reported losses were 68 for the RAF and 125 for the Luftwaffe. That night saw the normal mine laying and bombing, but at a much lower rate than of late. However, if Dover could not be humbled during the day, the Luftwaffe hoped the mines they placed near there, along with the Thames Estuary and Harridge, would do the job. Also during the night, the German U-boat 62 surfaced 60 miles southwest of Stravanger, Norway. The British submarine HMS Sea Line just happened to be in the area and fired off three torpedoes. The fish went wide, but then the Sea Line attacked with her deck gun. Still, U-boat 62 was able to dive and escape. Unfortunately, a British steamer off the coast of Ireland, which was carrying tons of fruit, wheat, grain, zinc, and other cargo, was not so lucky. U-Boat 99 managed to sneak up on it and send it to the ocean floor. Six crew were killed, but 88 survivors used their lifeboats and eventually made their way to shore. For Tuesday, July 30th, low clouds and a light rain would halt most air operations for the day. But even if the rain and clouds had not come, there would have been reduced activity anyway, at least on the British side. No ships were allowed to go through the channel as to give all involved a few days off from responding to attacks on shipping and coastal cities. But Garing had to be able to get at the RAF fighters. So, early in the morning, bombs were dropped in the west and south. There were some casualties, as people were caught unawares. But structural damage was also done to some shops in Hull, the St. Anthem Aerodrome, and a married men's sleeping quarters, and at Norwich, a bus station, a few homes, and a water main. There were also casualties there. There were also five raids plotted to the far north, between Flamborough Head and the Orkneys. But while the meteorological flights managed to return home, one of the raiders, an HE-111, was chased down by Spitfires from 603 Squadron and shot down around noon, near Montrose. To the south, convoys waited out the restricted movement, but a few ships off Essex and Suffolk were found by German patrols and attacked by ME 110s. It took a while, but around 3.30 that afternoon, hurricanes from 85 Squadron managed to locate and shoot one of them down near Suffolk. Late in the day, HMS Delight bombed the previous day, sank at anchor in Portland Harbor. The weather remained dreadful, and there was a scattering of bombing throughout the night, mostly due to its relative safety. The RAF lost no planes that day, and that's how Dowding intended it to be. The Luftwaffe lost five aircraft on this overcast day. So total reported losses to date remained 68 for the RAF, and the Germans were now at 130. Meanwhile, far-ranging events also took place in Germany. For Hitler... Taking in everything from politics to the weather, announced it was time. He ordered Goering to be ready to launch the major air war with only a 12 hours notice. Hitler wanted to surprise and overwhelm the British fighter planes. Goering, normally bombastic in everything he did, politely asked his Fuhrer for a few more days. The weather, it seems, was hampering his ability to get at the RAF. Hitler agreed, but told him the order would come soon. So Gehring had his planes fly over the Channel and southern Britain. Nothing happened. Gehring then had small bomber formations flying over Britain. Again, nothing happened. The pilots who were ready to move against Great Britain and on the side increase their scores were vexed by the British. Wednesday, July 31st, like the day before, would see significant political action in Germany among the Nazi elite. Over Britain... The weather was generally fair, with a mist in the channel. But, in an ironic way, the lack of cloud cover would give pause to the launching of many raids this day. Hitler gathered his commanders and told General Field Marshal von Braulich, the Army Commander-in-Chief, and General Field Marshal Halder, the Chief of General Staff, Goering, 
and General Jezenik, Chief of Air Staff, that he would attack Russia that year. He said, with Russia defeated, Britain's last hope will be gone. And I can just hear all of you now saying, really? Uh, where should I begin? It's already the end of July. Have there been any troop movements from France to the east? Has anyone gathered winter clothing and supplies? We can't possibly start this until September. Isn't our Air Force still in northern France? Has a general strategy and a list of objectives been worked out for Russia? We can't possibly take over all of Russia. It's too large. Didn't you just order us to reduce the number of active regular troops since France surrendered? And what does all of this have to do with the weeks-long running battle between the German generals and admirals, arguing over how many men and what supplies should be ferried over to Britain, and how many ships, and along how wide a front? And, my Fuhrer, if you could stop saying, we are going to surprise the British with an attack, that would be best for all. They know we are coming. They have been bombing our barges for weeks now. In fact, there was a growing concern about the damage to the city of Hamburg by British bombers. And lastly, Hitler may have impressed some of his generals with his going against their advice and winning decisive battles anyway, like in Poland, Norway, and in the West, but this was too much. But then we all, you, me, and those generals remember, this is a dictatorship. This is not a vote or a discussion. This is what they will do. They all knew he wanted to attack Russia. They wanted to attack Russia. He even said how important it was in Mein Kampf. There, he had stated the necessity of bringing Russia low and taking the land Germany needed. But now was not the time. And they would win this particular argument. Their ally was none other than Admiral Raider. When Hitler announced that the invasion would take place by mid-August, Raider said that his navy would not be ready until mid-September. This, combined with the additional time that Goering asked for, changed the Nazi warlord's mind. Still, it's interesting to contemplate that Hitler was willing to start a new war in the East, in the hopes of not having to finish one in the West. Hey everyone, Ray here. Imagine being the first to invent something, or travel to lands that no one of your group has ever seen before. That's the story that American history tellers from Wondery wants to share with you. Kind of like the original Star Trek, President Thomas Jefferson in 1804 hired Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to head west into the great unknown, the undiscovered country, to find an all-water route to the Pacific Ocean. And though they did not find that waterway, they did come across and record previously unknown plants and animals, not to mention coming into contact with deadly diseases while surviving harsh weather. And as they made their way west, it would be the Native Americans in the Rocky Mountains that were stunned to see white men for the first time. But getting to the Pacific and back would take all their skills and strength, not to mention a huge chunk of luck. And of course, one young Native lady called Sacagawea, who saved the explorer's journals from a raging river and kept them from starvation, all the while carrying her own baby. Follow along as the American history tellers unfolds the story of these two men, their trials of facing mountain ranges, grizzly bears, and hostile natives. But more than discovery, their expedition was about who owned the American Northwest. All this and more is covered by the prolific and ever-engaging Lindsey Graham as he takes you along the imperfect paths ever westward, right alongside Lewis and Clark. So join American history tellers as they investigate how bravery, leadership, and luck helped these adventurers overcome impossible odds. Listen to American history tellers Lewis and Clark on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. And I apologize if I've given the impression that Garen was panicking. He wasn't. His confidence could not have been higher and there were two main reasons for this. The first was the exaggerated number of British planes shot down for the last few weeks. Some of this can be contributed to honest mistakes, and some to simply pilots lying to either build up their score or not wanting to let down their comrades. The other reason 
had to do with the British suspending convoys through the channel for the last few days. He saw it as a victory and didn't consider any other reason. But in the end, it was Garing's ego that allowed him to see what he wanted to see, to think his planes had won control of the skies, just like he had promised his leader. In fact, he believed that soon he would be ready to start phase two of his plans, to go after the RAF airfields. He felt he needed just a few more days to begin, but the truth was far different from the information he was given, probably by underlings fearful of turning in negative reports. So instead of the hundreds of RAF planes shot down, the total was between the 68 that I have counted to somewhere around 77 by others' estimates. There were about 43 aircraft damaged that would never see the skies again or require serious repair. As for the far more valuable pilots, to date 76 have been killed, with another 23 wounded. Returning to the planes, 496 planes had been built in July, which was 50% more than predicted. The British workers, like their German counterparts, had fear motivating their work. But in the end, it came down to this. The RAF had more planes available at the end of July than they did at the beginning. And as far as the suffering of civilians, there were, to date, 258 casualties, with 321 more injured. Again, Garing assumed these numbers were much larger. Going back to the air war, the Scottish northeast coast was spared this day, only seeing a few reconnaissance flights. There were no engagements. On the east coast, a raid approached a convoy near Harridge about 6.15 that morning, but again, in trying to switch up their tactics and catch their real target exposed, the convoy was flown over, but not attacked. It was then that the raiders' true intent became clear. They then flew straight at other shipping and dropped their bombs at four ships near Lowstoff. They then went after a naval unit near Yarmouth Roads. Three squadrons lifted off to intercept, but the tactic worked, and the raiders were able to return to France unmolested. However, their bombs were off target. To the southwest, near the Cornish coast, a convoy that was something other than the norm was heading east towards Dover. Whatever made this convoy unique allowed it to ignore the band on daytime channel passing, and the Germans seemed to be aware of it. Several reconnaissance flights were spotted, and soon after, Fighter Command sent three squadrons to patrol overhead. If this was supposed to scare the Luftwaffe away, it did not work. A group of bombers and fighters approached, and the RAF fighters tried to keep them away. The fighting was intense and seemed frantic to the Germans. Accuracy seemed less important than harassing the Luftwaffe aircraft, but at least one Dornier 215 was shot down and the convoy was safe. Sadly, I was unable to find out what the convoy held. Later that afternoon, a raid of 15 German aircraft approached Dover, and the RAF rose to give challenge. A Spitfire from 74 Squadron took out an ME-109, but in the dogfight, two other Spitfires were lost. The RAF pilots were not used to losing more than they took, so called in another squadron. However, the raiders left before reinforcements could arrive. Looking at a map of the channel, Dover is one of the closest points to northern France, and therefore had a significant part in the invasion plans. Namely, the air above it had to be controlled by the Luftwaffe if any invasion was to succeed. So around 5 p.m., the Dover balloon barrage was attacked, and dozens of the balloons were destroyed. Obviously, the Luftwaffe was planning on some low-level, accurate bombing to prepare the way. There were other raiding parties that day that took off from Calais. They circled overhead, approached Dover, but returned to a base without attacking. That night saw the customary bombing around Wales and to the south. There was also mine laying near the Thames estuary to the far southwest and south Wales. The RAF lost three aircraft this day versus the five of the Luftwaffe. Total reported losses to date were 71 and 135, respectively. Of course, war was being waged beyond the Channel. The German Navy was doing its part to strangle the British into submission. 
The German U-boat 99 came upon convoy OB-191 and sunk two British steamers off the north coast of Ireland, the Jamaica Progress and the Jersey City. The Jamaica, which was carrying 2,179 tons of fruit from Jamaica, lost seven crew members, with another 47 others eventually being rescued. The Jersey lost two of its crew, with another 43 being rescued. Only after sinking these two ships was U-99 chased away by death charges. However, it later returned in the day, but a flying boat came and dropped enough bombs to chase it away for a second time. But it escaped undamaged. Back in the channel, the British destroyer HMS Whitshead hit a mine head-on and part of its bow was ripped away. She was then towed to Harwich, stern first, by the destroyer HMS Wild Swan. HMS Whitshead would undergo repairs at Chatham until December 21st. Off in the South Atlantic, the German armed merchant cruiser Penguin destroyed the British steamer Domingo de la Ringa. Eight crew members were killed and 30 more were taken prisoner. One crewman, Juan Garcia, would die in a POW camp. Thursday, August 1st, 1940, would be a historic day for both Germany and Great Britain. But for now, let's focus on the strip of water between them. The weather over Britain was mostly fair, with a slight overcast in the Strait and Channel. But as it got warmer, the skies cleared. Activity was relatively reduced as Gehring rested his men in anticipation. The Channel saw reconnaissance flights early in the morning, and soon after, trawlers were attacked just south of Celsius Bill. The raiders were left unchallenged. The same thing happened off the East Coast later that morning, but there, the weather prevented any successful engagement. Back in the Channel, small raids would approach the South Coast, only to turn away before any contact could be made by the British. The day would be spent by Fighter Command, chasing away potential raids or dealing with infuriating reconnaissance flights. One flight even went as far to the northwest of Cornwall as it could, clearly looking for shipping. As the flights to the south turned around, a few did not head home in time, and right before 3 p.m. that afternoon, 145 Squadron, made up of hurricanes, engaged potential raiders and shot down a few 88 Junkers. However, one hurricane fell to the sea with them. Pressure was kept on the island of White as Yarmouth saw several reconnaissance flights and then small groups of raiders. But each time a flight turned around, Fighter Command got a bit better at timing their response. That afternoon, 242 Squadron, again made up of hurricanes, shot down one Euchre's 88 and one HE 111. But besides the shipping attack that morning, the Luftwaffe's best performance came around 3 that afternoon as a Blenheim bombed a railway goods yard and two timber yards near Norwich. Both were set ablaze. Six people were killed and 54 more injured. The rest of the day was spent by the Luftwaffe bombing deeper inland by single or small groups of raiders. The RAF lost a single hurricane that day and the Luftwaffe five aircraft. Total reported losses to date were 72 and 140, respectively. That night saw the normal mine lane to the east, south, and west, but a large area was covered by German bombers. Damage was widespread, but not massive, and some homes and cities were hit with something other than bombs. In places like Southampton and Somerset, thousands of pieces of paper fell from the sky. They were translated copies of Hitler's July 19th speech. It was entitled, The Last Appeal to Reason. Hitler hoped this gesture would lead to something, but doubted it, and so issued Directive Number 17 that day. In part, it read, I have decided that war against Great Britain will be pursued and intensified by sea and by air, with the object of bringing about the country's final defeat. He believed that a final knockout blow of Britain was within the Luftwaffe's grasp. He had been reading the same inflated reports that Gehring had. The document went on to say, In order to establish the necessary conditions for the final conquest of England, 
I intend to intensify air and sea warfare against the English homeland. I therefore order as follows. 1. The German Air Force is to overpower the English Air Force with all the forces at its command in the shortest possible time. The attacks are to be directed primarily against flying units, their ground installations, and their supply organizations, but also the aircraft industry, including those manufacturing anti-aircraft equipment. 2. After achieving temporary or local air superiority, the air war is to be continued against ports, in particular against stores of food, and also against stores of provisions in the interior of the country. Attacks on the south coast ports will be made on the smallest possible scale in view of our forthcoming operations. 3. On the other hand, air attacks on enemy warships and merchant ships may be reduced except where some particularly favorable target happens to present itself, where such attacks would lend additional effectiveness to those mentioned in paragraph 2, or where such attacks are necessary for the training of air crews for future operations. 4. The intensified air warfare will be carried out in such a way that the Air Force can at any time be called upon to give adequate support to naval operations against suitable targets. It must also be ready to take a full force in Operation Sea Line. 5. I reserve to myself the right to decide on terror attacks as measures of reprisal. 6. The intensification of the air war may begin on or after August 5th. The exact time is to be decided by the Air Force after completion of preparations and in light of the weather. The document ended with, The Navy is authorized to begin the proposed intensified naval war at the same time. This document was supposed to be the beginning of Nazi Germany's latest victory. It troubled Hitler that he could not exactly see how the war would play out and how Britain would be subdued, but surely it was only a matter of time now. And of course, the war carried on at sea. U-boat 34, about halfway between Aberdeen and Stavanger, came upon the British submarine HMS Spearfish. Spearfish was on the surface and was rocked by several torpedoes from U-boat 34. She went under for the last time about 7.04 p.m., with the loss of 41 of her crew. One survivor, able seaman William Pester, was taken prisoner. The other British sub that was sunk was the World War I era submarine HMS Oswald. Oswald was charging its batteries on the surface, about 15 miles south of Sardinia, when the Italian destroyer Ugolino Vivaldi rammed the sub and finished it off with depth charges. Fifty-two men died, and the three survivors were taken captive. Also, a Greek steamer was sunk by an Italian submarine just south of Crete. And finally, a Swedish steamer carrying parts for RAF fighters was sunk by U-boat 59, northwest of Ireland. Despite all this, Britain knows how important the Mediterranean is to her livelihood. So the Royal Navy begins Operation Hurry, which will attempt to disrupt the Italian and German raiding ships in the Mediterranean. The British aircraft HMS Argus, reinforced with 12 more hurricanes, joins Admiral Somerville's H-Force of the HMS Hood, battleship HMS Valiant, aircraft carrier HMS Ark Royal, two cruisers, and ten destroyers. Next time, Hitler will release Goering and the Luftwaffe, the largest air force the world has seen. The weather in the channel will taunt the invaders for a few days. Then, stand aside and the largest air battle to date will commence. Greetings from Central Virginia. Um, Sorry it's taken so long to get this episode out. But the one company that provides internet to where I live has gone belly up. And so I've been without the internet for about three or four weeks, which will stop a podcast in its tracks. So I'm trying to get back up to speed, getting somebody else. Um, So I'll be able to add things to the internet again. I'll be able to respond to emails and my Twitter and Facebook um, entries will be a lot more regular and constant. So again, I'm very sorry. I know how frustrating it is. 
and to make it up to you, what I'll probably do for the next couple of episodes is I'll skip the first section that I've been doing for a while where I give some basic information about something, and I'll just cover the battle for at least for the next two episodes to get us to Adler Tog as fast as I can. And I've talked it over with the wife, and I'm going to get some extra time at home. So the next two to three episodes should come out a lot sooner than they normally do. And again, this is just me trying to find a way to say to, to all of you out there, I'm really sorry it's taken so long. So we're, we're slowly getting back on track here. So I just want to thank a couple people for their donations, and I will let you go. Uh, the first person is RG from the UK, and then there's Michael B from the UK, John Y from Georgia in the US, William A, a very nice gentleman who's been sending me some emails uh, from the UK, James Y from Brooklyn in the US, Brian A from Essex in the UK, and Paul B from Liverpool in the UK. So thank you very much. There's a lot of books I've got my eye on for the war in North Africa and the things going on in the Mediterranean, that kind of thing, and Lend Lease and a whole bunch of things. But anyway, so thank you for everyone who's donated. It really does help to uh, keep a lot of information coming that I need um, in future in future podcasts. So take care, everyone, and the next episode, I promise, will come out a lot sooner. Thank you.